as we as we invite the working of your Holy Spirit in us this morning. So thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Back in the book of Ephesians, it's been a while, <laughs> three weeks, I think, uh, with uh, Palm Sunday and then Resurrection Sunday last week. And now back in Ephesians chapter two, uh, we're looking at grace today, the heart of the gospel. And it truly is the grace of God poured out. There is no other way that we can get connected to God were it not for his grace towards us that's extended to us. There's a question that I want to start with, and, and uh, it's an interesting question. So I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but what is it that makes Christianity from that's distinct, different from all other religions or belief systems in the world? Uh, and I was reading this week and I came across this years ago. That, that was the same question. The very question was discussed at a Christian leaders conference. Some of the attendees argue that Christianity is unique in teaching that God became a man. Uh, but some objected, saying that other religions teach similar doctrines. What about the resurrection? Others said no. It was argued that other faiths believe that the dead rise again. And the, the, the discussion actually began to grow heated. Uh, and then one of the attendees uh, came in late. There's a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis. We've heard of him. Those of us have been around the church for very long. He came in late. He sat down and asked all the others, what's all the ruckus about? Uh, and then when he learned that it was a debate about the uniqueness of Christianity, he immediately commented. He wasn't aware of what was going on until that time, but he immediately commented, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And that's true. As we're looking here at Ephesians chapter 2, we're seeing the theme of this entire, entire chapter is what it is to be reconciled to God. And we're finding that uh, the absolute key ingredient to being reconciled is God's grace poured out. What does that look like? What it looks like his son going to that cross for you, for me. And that is the expression of God's grace, his unmerited favor towards us. We're going to talk about that uh, at length this morning. We're only going to cover three verses, if that. <laughs> and so uh, I, I just want to look at that. The salvation by grace through faith. It is a central major doctrine in the Christian faith, but it's also a very essential doctrine that we understand. Uh, we need to have a good working knowledge of grace or we can get tripped up. We can get caught up in a works-based reality spiritually, which is not good. Uh, not that works aren't good, but there's a cart before the horse theology out there. It's very subtle at times. And so we need to be uh, informed. We need to understand what, what God's word has to say about this. So to begin with, I want to look at salvation. Salvation is defined as the act of being delivered or redeemed or rescued. It's the result of having been, past tense, reconciled. That's a done deal. Again, we look back to the cross. That's where our reconciliation comes from. It's, it's, it's the result, result of having been reconciled to God through the finished work of Christ. <clears throat> so, excuse me, salvation by grace through faith is at the heart of Christianity. It constitutes the very heart of the gospel. Grace is the supreme truth that God accepts us without condition. Gang, if you don't understand anything else about God this morning, understand that. There are no zero, none, no conditions by which God accepts you. When we simply place our trust in him, when we, when we trust in the atoning work of his incarnate son, it's by his grace. Although we're helplessly sinful, God in his grace forgives us completely. And I mean completely. He washes it clean. It's done. He says, I'll remember your sin no more as far as the east is from the west. It's by his infinite grace that we're saved, not by... Uh, moral character. I, many times you ask people, well, I'm a good person. Uh, no, it's not by that. It's not by works of righteousness. Well, look at all that I've done. I gave at the office and I helped the old ladies across the street and I've, I'm a part of this civic organization or that. No, it, it's not even by commandment keeping, by wanting to 
live a life that's pleasing in God's sight. And this is subtle. It's not even by that. It's not by my obedience. It's, and it's not even by what, what I like to call the three-legged stool. When people are in spiritual distress, very often I'll ask the question, are, are you in fellowship? Are you in prayer? And are you reading, studying God's word? It's not even on the basis of those things. It's on the basis solely of his grace. The point is when we do nothing else but accept God's total pardon in our lives, it's then that we receive the gift of eternal life. So today we're going to start. Uh, we've been in Ephesians chapter 2. We have gone through the first seven verses. We're going to be in verses 8 through 10 this morning. But I want to start, I want to back up to the beginning of the chapter. As I said, it's been three weeks since we've been together in Ephesians. And I want to just tag some bases and, and review quickly, uh, if there is such a thing, uh, review the first seven verses. So verse 1 Actually, verses 1 through 3 talk about, if you remember, I outlined this when we first started. It talks about our need to be reconciled, uh, that, that we have to see our spiritual condition prior to Christ in order to understand our need. And that's what Paul goes into here. In verse 1, he says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. For Christians, remember, he's writing this to a church at Ephesus, he's writing to Christians. He's saying that you have stepped literally from death to life. You've been regenerated. We looked at that. I'm not going to go and do it again, but regenerated means the imparting of life. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves Note that. And he, he talks about three ways that we conducted ourselves. First, he says, in the lusts of our flesh. Are that, and when you, talk, when you look at flesh in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's a reference to our sinful nature, that na nature of Adam that we're born with. So that we are spiritually dead. We have a sin nature. Uh, so he says, and we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh or our sinful nature. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And number three, we're by nature children of wrath. That we were destined for wrath. That we were destined for judgment. He says, but you, he made alive. So in verses two and three, we look at the fact that of, we are the walking dead outside of Christ. That we're spiritually bankrupt. We're void. And how we lived, he says, we walked according to the course of this world. That, that walking is a manner of life. And that we conducted ourselves in these three ways. That's what he's, his point is. He's talking, he's painting a picture of a life that's lived outside of God, that's lived outside of the provision that Christ made when he atoned for sin. So three weeks ago, we were in verses four through uh, seven, or yeah, four through seven here, and we looked at the process of personal reconciliation. In verse 4, we read, but God. Remember, we, we talked about that at length. There was a, there, we looked at a lot of aspects of what that means. He says, but God, <clears throat> who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. In verse 4, what he's talking about there is God's motives, his motivation when he saved us. First is he is abundant in mercy, that he is a merciful God. Uh, we see in the Bible, in the New Testament, that mercy triumphs over judgment. It doesn't mean that he replaces judgment with mercy. It, what it means is that he makes a provision for the judgment to be rolled away in his mercy towards us. And that provision, again, is Jesus Christ. So we talk about his abundant mercy, and then we also talk about his great love, the great love that he has for us. Both of these are directed towards us actively. The Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, and uh, what a great statement that is. Now in verses 5 through 7, we looked at the past, present, and future work of God in reconciling us individually. Uh, because God, it's like in, in the Old Testament with Israel, it's that he worked in a group. And, and it's not a group in the New Covenant. It's, it, when he looked at, he worked with Israel as a nation, as a, as a people. And yet with the church, with you and I, he, he works with a group. It's called the body of Christ. 
but he's very specific that it's a group of individuals. And that's the way that God has chosen for us to relate to him and for he to relate to us. So in verse 5, we read, even when we were dead, there's that word again, dead, not limping along, not sick, not having problems. No, dead, spiritually dead, no life. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, as, as he said in verse 1, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. He puts that in, in parentheses there. It's like he's got to get that out. He's, he's getting on to this thing. He's talking about the mercy of God, the love of God, and he's connecting that to God's grace because God's grace literally is his love poured out, his mercy, his compassion poured out. Uh, he, he says we were dead and we were made alive. Uh, verse 6, and he raised us up together and he made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are presently, positionally seated in the heavenly places in Christ. In Philippians 3, Paul writes, uh, our citizenship is in heaven, that we wait now to move in, so to speak, but our citizenship is already there, that we are already members of God's family, his forever family, I love that term, we're already part of his kingdom. We operate in an unseen kingdom, but there is definitely a kingdom. And, and that he raised us up. He seated us in the heavenlies. So if you look at this, though, if what he's saying so far in chapter two is he contrasts. He's saying, look, you used to walk according to the course of this world. You used to be a child of wrath. You used to feed your lusts. But now... You've been raised up, seated together with Christ. Uh, you're no longer walking according to the course of this world. You're no longer walking under the dominion of its shadowy ruler, the, the prince of the power of the air is how he says it. We walk differently now. And he's going to go into why that is as we move through this chapter. We're operating from the kingdom. Uh, being seated in the heavenlies, now I operate from the kingdom in the way that I conduct my life, in the way that I walk. So my life is conducted differently. My life is walked out differently than it used to be. And that's normal, guys. For a Christian, that's normal. The world looks on and says, oh, they just have a bunch of rules. No, I have a different master. I live in a different kingdom. I don't live according to the kingdom of this world. I live according to the kingdom of God. I don't live by the, the rules of this world, which says, hey, just go for it. Feed your lusts. I live in a manner that's pleasing to my king. I want to live a life that's out in the open that's pleasing to him. Huge difference. Huge difference in the motivation. It might look like I'm rule keeping out there. As we move through this this morning, you'll see why it's not. Verse 7, he says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. The exceeding, in other words, overflowing riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In this passage, if there's one thing we're seeing is that God saved us because he loves us. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with understanding the love of God in your life, in your heart? Are you experiencing his love? Is there a block there? Perhaps ongoing sin that's separating you from God? Are you experiencing his love or is there a block there because you don't know him? You've never walked with him. You've never transacted with him on the basis of his grace and forgiveness and mercy and love. Uh, we'll talk about that as we go through, gang. And, and if that's you, today's the day. I, I, I want to invite you to consider giving your life to Christ. We live in a crazy world. We live in, in, in circumstances that are, that are about as strange as it could get. We live in, in very stressful times. I know people in, in my own circle that are, are, are not able to, to take care of bills and not able to move forward with their lives. And, and, and there are question marks out there. How's this going to end? Because it really looks like it's going to get worse before it gets better. All of that. You don't have to sh shoulder that burden alone. Yeah, these things are concerning. But we, see, we serve a, a risen Lord who will shoulder that burden for us. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, All you who are labor and, and who are heavily laden, if you're weighted down, 
come to me and I'll give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, the picture there is, is, is of two oxen in, in the first century. That's how they got things accomplished. It, and there was a double yoke. And what they would do is they would put the oxen together with this yoke and, and the oxen would pull the load together. And, and yet when we are trying to bear the, the weight of that load ourselves, we're not going anywhere. We're not able to really figure it out. We're not able, we don't have answers. And yet he says, take my yoke upon you. My load is easy. My burden is life. Learn from me. He says, that's why we spend time in God's word. Learn from me and I'll give you rest for your soul. That's a promise. That's a promise to believers. It's a promise to people that haven't yet given their lives to him. Very serious. It needs to be very intentional. And it's something that's offered freely to us because that's the nature of grace. The context here is he loved us when we were dead. We didn't have any life and God loved us. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We had no future. We had nothing to look forward to except for, according to what God's word says here, wrath. The wrath of God being poured out. In Romans, it tells us we actually were storing up wrath. We were adding more wrath because of the way that we conducted our lives, the way that we walked in our lives. So, so far in Ephesians, we see that God's chosen us. He adopted us to be a part of, as I said, his forever family. Uh, and we have a reminder here. He, he's telling the Ephesians, he's saying, look, you got to remember, you used to be dead but now you're alive. You used to exclude God from your life. You pushed him away, but now he's, he's been brought close. He's, he's telling the Ephesians, you were just like the rest of the unbelievers, even as the rest. That's what he means when he says that. He, we ended last time with the point that he makes in, in verse seven, where he talks about the exceeding riches of God's grace will be expressed in his kindness towards us. In other words, the way that grace shows up in my life is through seeing the kindness of God that he extends to us. And he extends it to us in every way, at any time, and he will forever. That's what he's talking about here. In any circumstance, the grace of God is available. It's extended. It's expressed in his kindness towards us. Uh, I mentioned last time, have you thought about the kindness of God? He's not this guy that's up there that's waiting for you to get out of line so he can whap you into shape and, and beat you up or, you know, cause all this you know, hear weird things, people guessing at what God's intention is with this pandemic and all. And I, I mentioned, be careful how you interpret that. I certainly don't want to I don't like when somebody puts word, words in my mouth and I, I don't want to put any in his. Uh, he's, de he's definitely working. He's definitely moving. He's definitely allowing this. We don't fully understand. And yet we, we know that he says, when you see these things, look up. When you see these things, draw close. When you see these things, make sure that your soul is in good condition. And he blesses that. He pours out his spirit on us. The point is, is that when we understand our sin, when we really have a good, I'll tell you what, uh, I think about my sin at times and I think about all that God has forgiven me, all that he has taken out of the way in order to have a relationship with him, all that he has forgotten. And not that he forgets, but he chooses not to remember. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, there's a difference there. He, he's God. He can't forget, but he chooses not to remember my sin. When I have an understanding of my sin, when I see the gravity of my sin, when I see the weight of how it separated me from God, how I allowed my sin, the way that I walked, the way I conducted my life to separate me from God. And that's his point here. When I get a handle on that, I, I am just ever so grateful of the kindness that he has shown to me, the kindness that he shows to you. 
Now in verses 8 through 10, Paul is going to sharpen the focus here. He's going to sum up what God's work of individual reconciliation looks like in our lives. Uh, I'm going to read through verses 8 through 10, then we'll come back and unpack it a bit. He says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. One of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. In verse 9, Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. There's a lot of meat here, gang. We're going to just uh, go through it. Let's take it and start at verse 8 here. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He re repeats this. Remember, parenthetically, he talks about it's by grace in verse 5. And now he's going to strengthen this. He's going to talk about it more. Uh, and essentially what it is is there's two parts. There's God's part is grace. My part is faith to believe. And we're going to look at that. There are some subtleties here that I want you to catch, uh, but I want you to understand that when he talks about it is the gift of God, he's not talking about faith. He's talking about grace being the gift of God. That's the structure of the sentence. I'm not a Greek scholar, but that's how it looks in the original language that when he talks about it being the gift of God, it's, a, it's pointing to the grace of God. It's not pointing to faith. I hear people say, well, I have my faith. And I would submit, unless the object of that faith is, G faith is Jesus and the fact that he went to that cross for you, that it's vain faith. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about vain faith. He says, unless you believed in vain. And that's where the object of your faith is not Jesus went to the cross. He atoned for my sins, for this that we've been looking at, that that's why he died. And that in that, as I understand that, and I see that the object of my faith is Jesus went to the cross. He died for me. He, we talked last week about he rose from the dead for me to give me power, to give me life. That through his resurrection, that it was God's validation that his life was acceptable. His sacrifice had been accepted. And so as we look at this, we see God's part is grace. My part is to believe. And it's, it's, it's an informed faith. It's, 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 we'll talk, I'm going to give you an example here in a minute. But he, what he essentially is saying that grace is the basis of everything that God has done for us. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. There's nothing I could do to earn it. Lost sinners deserve one thing. Retribution judgment and wrath that's it that, that we are absolutely helpless if it's not for the grace of god at work yes grace saves us but it also sustains us we'll talk about that too so you and i were na by nature children of wrath ruled by satan we didn't have any life and we lived for ourselves how's that for a picture of a happy life it's not it's a recipe for strife. It's a recipe for wandering aimlessly through this life, not understanding there's any purpose to it at all. So when we talk about the change that takes place, we look at the change here that he starts out with children of wrath and serving your lusts and living for yourself and walking and, and all of that, according to the course of this world. And then he says, but God... And then he goes on and he begins to illustrate this life that's lived by the grace of God. What is it that makes this change possible? How does this change take place? And I'd submit to you, not with us. It's something that's entirely born in the heart of God and through the actions of God on my behalf when I am absolutely helpless to do it myself. Verse 8, he, again he says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's the gift of God. Uh, note that it's in the past tense. If there is some aspect of me earning this, I grew up in a false religion. And, and when you ask about salvation by grace, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they would agree, but they'd say, is that it for salvation? No, well, no, there's salvation by, by grace, but also by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Oh, oh yeah, by water baptism. Oh, yeah, by, also by good works. Hogwash. 
That completely disagrees with what Paul is saying here under the authority of the Holy Spirit. So it's nothing that we did. It's nothing that we provide. It's, it, we don't even provide the faith necessary. It is a gift from him. We'll talk about that as we go. Uh, there's a very subtle thing here that I want to make sure to tag as, as we go along. So it, it's past tense. It's a done deal. That's the point I want to make here. It's very important that we understand that faith is not the cause of our salvation. Understand that. The construction of the sentences, again, it refers to the grace of God, not to faith, not to our faith. So what is faith? It's essentially, we've looked at that in Hebrews 11.1. 1, it's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's trusting in someone or something. Essentially, that's what the, 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 the crux of what faith is. So we trust in Jesus Christ for the gift of salvation. And faith is a gift as well. Jesus, when he was with his disciples, again, I want to make sure that uh, I don't. I, I don't want you to see faith as a work because it's not. It, it, it's a response. Um, when Jesus was with his disciples, he he said, "Look, the Holy Spirit is not yet in you. He is with you, but not yet in you." And he will come upon you. The the three manifest manifestations of the Holy Spirit are the the with, the in, and the upon. When he is with us, for the unbelieving, unregenerate man, the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door to that person's heart. He, he's the one that bears witness and says, yes, this is true. This is truth. Yes, that is me knocking on the door of your heart. Yes, that is me wanting to reveal myself to you, to manifest myself to you. That is me wanting for you to respond. That's the with. And so just the faith to respond to the gospel is the result of the Holy Spirit being with someone. It's not even that that we produce. Yes, our will comes into play, and this is where I want to be careful, because we have a free will, and we can say no. We can tell God, no, I don't want Jesus. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to understand him. I don't want to hear this Bible. You know, we, and the world is full of people that push back. And yet, he loves us so much that he pursues us. Jesus says to the woman at the well, that these kind of people that worship God in spirit and in truth are the ones that God pursues to worship him. So there's a with and an in and an upon that result in my responding to the gospel, the with prior to Christ. After that is when he comes in and, and he begins to work. He comes in and he literally indwells me and gives me that power that we've talked about last week, that power to live, that power to, to, to be transformed into the image of his son. Here's an illustration. Think about water flowing through a garden hose. I thought this is a particularly good illustration. It doesn't, don't try to make it walk on all fours. You know, well, what if there's a hole in the hose and any of that stuff? But, but go with me on this. Think about water flowing through a garden hose. The water is God's grace. It's that which comes to us, that which he extends to us. The hose is faith. So grace, the water, comes through faith, the hose. Before we're saved, we're in, in our fallen state, we put a kink in that hose and we're holding it to prevent the water from flowing. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear. Da, 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 put my fingers in my ears, all of that. It's essentially putting a kink in the hose. It's saying, I, I am not going to believe. And therefore, God's grace doesn't come to me. When we repent and believe, when we come to a place where he has softened our hearts and we see, Lord, I don't, I can't manage my life. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Any number of things that he uses to get our attention. And we repent. We say, I'm tired of living my life this way. Uh, I'm going to put my faith in you. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe he went to the cross for me. I believe he rose from the dead. And oh, Lord, please give me this power to live. Give me illumination of who you are. Reveal yourself to me. All of that that's part and parcel with salvation, with the salvation experience, is when we realize our way of life, walking according to the course of this world, it's leaving us high and dry. And we 
at that point we choose to trust in God's provision, the cross, it's that we trust that it's better than our own. We can't work it out ourselves. We release the kink and the water flows freely. That's salvation by grace through faith. And, and I know that that's a limited illustration, but uh, it's a good one. Salvation is the effect that the water has, uh, that, that the grace of God has upon my thirsty soul. So salvation is the result uh, of my faith, my trusting in his grace extended. It's nothing that I produce other than simply believing it. It's as though I'm out on a lake and I'm drowning and somebody throws me a rope. I choose whether or not to grab the rope. That doesn't mean that it's based on works. It means that I take a hold of the lifeline that he's extended or not. So it's totally God's work. His grace is a free gift ready for anyone who will drink of Christ and stop rejecting his provision. The Bible tells us his will that all would repent and come to him. It's his will that none would perish, but all would come. And so we know that not all do, but it's God's will that grace is extended to every single one. When he says it's not of yourselves, salvation is not produced or earned by us. We've been talking about that. In 1 Corinthians 15 last week, we wrote that, read that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. He died, was buried, and he rose. That he did that for us. The gift has been extended. I could accept it. Or I can reject it. The point here is that salvation, beginning to end, is all of God. Nothing, our works or our faith contribute, uh, not, neither our works or our faith contribute to our salvation. It's all of the glory belongs to him. We respond. Verse 9, not by works, lest anyone should boast, he says here. It's the second time that he reinforces this. He, and this, it really couldn't be clearer. It pretty well speaks for itself. But when you look at it and you think about out there in, in our culture and in our world, if you were to take a survey and ask people if they're sure they're going to heaven, very often you'd get a couple of different responses. One is, I hope I'm good enough. Uh, that's a person that, that wants to think, if I've done enough good things, I'll get in. Or another is, well, I've lived a pretty good life. In other words, God is somehow in my debt because it's based on my works. It's based on my performance. And now he owes me heaven. I submit to you both of those. Yes, they're the result of fallen thinking to the result of the natural man, the way he tries to reason through the things of God. But you got to realize, I did not make the gift. I did not earn the gift. I can only choose what to do with the gift. That's what the point of this is. When he says, lest anyone should boast, if we could save ourselves, we would boast. Uh, most of the boasting uh, that we're talking about, it relates to works. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no way see the kingdom of heaven. What he was saying is the, the Pharisees believed that they could produce their own righteousness. That's why they had lists and lists and lists of obedience, rules, uh, galore, volumes. And they believed that through obeying those, that that was what produced the righteousness that they needed to be related to God. And what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that unless your righteousness exceeds that, unless you have more than that, you can never make enough. And so what he's illustrating to the people in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew is it's you can't get there from here except for one way. You can either be perfect in every conceivable way, exceedingly, or you can put faith in the finished work that he was out to perform at that time, in the work that we look back on that he accomplished on our behalf. It's by faith. It's by grace through faith. So 
One of the things that illustrates this is that when Jesus uh, talks about the rich young ruler, and it's in three of the Gospels, that we'll look at it in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, and uh, what it says here in verses 18 to 23 is this. He says, Now a certain ruler asked, him, asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He's getting right to the point. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Works. And he said, all, uh, the, the, the rich young ruler said, All these things I have kept from my, from my youth. I have done all of that, Jesus. He's boasting. Verse 22, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. This is not a commentary on being rich is a bad thing. This is a commentary on making it about your works. What Jesus is saying is if you're going to base it on rule keeping, on keeping the commandments, there's always one more. And, and that's the point that he's making here. He's telling this guy that you're basing your salvation, it, it, that what you must do to inherit eternal life is to keep the commandments, is to, to work out your own way. And yet Jesus says, well, if you're going to make it about working out your own way, go and sell everything. Get rid of it all. And come and follow me. And, and the, the guy realized he couldn't attain that because Jesus hit him right where he knew he lacked. Salvation is based, that, that's based on, on, on you or I. If it's based on what I do, if it's based on my performance, even the smallest degree is false. There will always be one more rule to keep. There will always be one more act of righteousness that I need to perform. There will always be one more thing that I need to do for God. Very subtle. There are a lot of religions, a lot of Christian churches out there that will subtly put a works trip on you. Be careful. It's solely by His grace, period, end of story. There is nothing beyond that that you have to do to merit salvation, because you don't. I don't. Salvation can't possibly be tied to our works. For one thing, as I mentioned, it's already been completed. It's done. In Hebrews 10, back when we were in Hebrews, we looked at Hebrews 10, we saw that you can't add anything to what God in Christ has already done, that he alone is the one that did the work. In Romans Chapter 3, we're talking about boasting here a little more, one other passage that comes to mind is in 327-28 of the book of Romans, we, Paul says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. There is that thing, faith, not works. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds or the works of the law. Very interesting. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, when he says our workmanship, our being Christians is the result of what God is doing. The Bible is a record of the activity of God. Think about it, folks. All the way back in Genesis, here man is created and man gets to the point where he rebels, Adam and Eve rebel against God. From that point forward, it is the activity of God to bring man into relationship with himself, to restore man, to reconcile man to himself. Remember, we're talking about reconciliation here. And so what Paul is saying here is this is the work. This is the reconciling work. You are his workmanship. His work, not yours. It all pointed, when we look at the, the Old Testament, when we look at God's work all the way through the pages of Scripture, the, the story of redemption starts way back. 
as I mentioned in the in the early pages of Genesis, it's all God's work in re reconciling man to Himself, of healing that broken relationship, of bringing man. Because He said, "The day that you eat of that fruit, you will die." And the work of, of redemption is that of bringing man back not only into alignment with God, but bringing man to life with God, giving him the very life of God through the agency of the Holy Spirit as a result of this transaction we call being saved by grace through faith. And all of it pointed to the work of the Messiah. Uh, when he says we're his workmanship, what, what he's saying there is we are his creative work. He says, the Greek word there for workmanship is the word poema. It's where we get the word poem from. What he's saying is, is we, are God's, we are God's handiwork. We are his workmanship in that sense. And that, it's the same thing like in Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul uses a, a lump of clay there. Uh, and he says that we're like lumps of clay that God fashions and shapes and molds. My wife is a potter and she makes beautiful pottery. She hasn't done it in a while, but but she takes that lump of clay and, and then by the time she's finished, she's got this beautiful vase or bowl or whatever. And, and, and in that sense, that's what he's talking about here. Talk about people that that get the notion that God's there to, to be exacting and demanding and that he's going to get your attention. He's going to do what he's going to do. And if you're out of line, you're in trouble, all of that stuff. No, he loves you. You're his workmanship. You're his pride and joy. And, and, and you're his poem. You're his expression of his own creative work in your life. How silly would it be to say that we are, for we are our own workmanship? How would that turn out? How, how's that working for you? And there's a lot of people that are doing that. When you look at the, the difference between Christianity, where we really provide nothing except simply believe the work that's been done, and God comes in, He fills us with His Holy Spirit, He been, begins to just kind of turn over the, the, the carts and to, to, push things out of our lives that aren't good for us, that don't glorify Him. And He begins to do this beautiful work, this creative work in us. And as we simply cooperate, that's what He does. That's what's going on inside. And as we yield to His work, it's a life of peace. It's a life of power. It's a life of joy. It's a life where the fruit of His Spirit comes in and it comes into play. All of this speaks to the process, we call it the process of sanctification, of being made holy. We have been declared holy, talked about that last week, uh, but we are now being made holy, that we are being conformed to the image of his son, that we are being conformed to the image of Christ, uh, learning to think like Jesus. That's why we use that as sort of a byline of this ministry is that that's what we're about. We're all in process. We're all at different places in our walk with the Lord. So we've got to be careful not to devote our time and our energies to what God is doing with someone else, but to yield ourselves to him and to say, Lord, here am I. Change my heart. Work in my life. Do that creative work. Let me be your expression. What a glorious way to live. Talk about a contrast, guys. Again, he starts out this chapter, you're dead. You are serving your lust. You're walking according to the course of this world. Satan is your ruler. All of that. And, and this, that transformation that comes, that miraculous, trans and it is a miracle, that miraculous transformation that comes through the, the work of the cross and the power of the resurrection, that we could walk in newness of life with purpose and intention and joy, even in the middle of really strange, stressful circumstances, that we can have joy. Because that runs a lot deeper. I could rabbit trail on that. I'm not going to, we don't have time. But the point is, is that it's, I'm being sanctified. I am being transformed by his creative work. I'm his poema. Essentially what sanctification means, by the way, is to be made more Christ-like. It means that we're being made like Him. 
uh, this is, and, and folks, it's a far cry from, you know, the, this is the, uh, vain faith, is, as I mentioned, it, it just doesn't get it. Uh, and if, if there's an aspect of that going on in your life, I would invite you to examine that. Let the Holy Spirit shine light on that. Turn from that. Embrace Him more fully. Be sold out because it's not about I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and then I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of going on and living for myself. That's not it. That's not being a true disciple. That's vain faith. Rather, he takes us in our, in our uniqueness. He, he takes us as we are. You don't have to clean up your act to come to him. He takes you, he takes me as we are. Just the same, I mean, with cracks and warts and blemishes and freckles and the whole deal. He accepts us, not on the basis of who we are, but on the basis of who his son is. But he then begins to shape us. He hones us, he challenges us, he grows us, he conforms us. As I cooperate with his work, as his workmanship, the fruit appears. As I respond to his grace, the fruit appears. As I yield myself as an instrument of righteousness, the Bible says, the fruit of his spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those things appear in my life and they grow. That's what fruit looks like. That's what it looks like when I respond to the grace of God. I'm not out there trying to push my own agenda. I'm not out there basing it on my works. I know it's all of him. And yet I also know, not but, but I also know that I am saved unto good works, that lest anybody should boast. It's not about boasting, but we're saved by grace, lest anybody should boast, not of ourselves, but as I'm saved unto good works, that those good works follow, they flow from a life that is lived out in the open in his sight. They flow as a response to the grace that I've been shown. Our good works testify of our salvation. Our good, good works testify of God's presence in my life. They testify of God's power in my life. There's a guy by the name of Billy Sunday. He was an evangelist, sort of the Billy Graham of the 19th century. Uh, he was a very, very famous evangelist. Uh, went all over the United States. He uh, was coming out of a bar one day with, he was a baseball player in Chicago, and coming out of a bar one day with five of his buddies, his teammates, and he happened to cross uh, some people that directed him to a place called the Pacific Garden Mission, where he went, he ended up giving his life to Christ, and, and uh, he would tell people after that, I was saved from the guttermost to the uppermost. I like that. That's the transforming work that's being talked about here. It's, it's his love that's a transforming love. It meets us where we're at, and when we receive his love, it always takes us where we should be. Uh, the love of God that saves my soul will also change my life. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what's happening in your circumstances. I know that we live in tough times. I know that uh, as I'm visiting with people on the phone or on Zoom or uh, whatever, that uh, there are things that are going on out there in all of our lives. These are challenging days. And yet, don't let these be days where you are not connected to the one who can make sense out of it. You might not have the answers, but it makes sense. I know in whom I've believed. I know that my life is hidden in the beloved. I know that he's in control. I've said many times, I, I can't affect your circumstances. Uh, I, I'm not God, obviously. But I can show you how to find the grace by the Word of God to live well within them. That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about His unmerited favor, His grace, which is His love poured out. And as we, as we come into that place of deepening our relationship with Him, 
if we know him or coming to him for the first time, there are answers. There is peace because it's that understanding of knowing that this is all something that's in his hands. There's great peace in that. There's great comfort in that. I don't have any idea how this thing's going to turn out. I don't have any idea what this is all going to look like a year from now, six months from now, three months from now. But I do know this. He does. And I can trust that because he's trustworthy. If you don't know Christ this morning, won't you consider giving your heart to him, letting the weight of these things, the weight of your life down upon Jesus. As I mentioned in, in Matthew 11, he says, come to me. I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart. I'll give you rest for your soul. I will take the burden of those circumstances and I'll shoulder them for you. And I'll pour my love out on your life. I'll pour my grace into your life. I'll forgive you for any thought, word, or deed that you've ever had or will have. I'll meet you in any circumstance, in any place, at any time. And I'll pour out my grace. That's so far beyond good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Ephesians and for the powerful words.